So we ended the last time thinking about how we can connect to a remote server like Amazon or Google or something like that um, in the last video I recorded. But sometimes you're going to send information like your bank account number or um, other personal information across the Internet, and you really probably don't want that to be listened to. Um, Every once in a while, you might send your social security number or something like that through the Internet. You really don't want that to be um, confiscated. So um, how can we make sure – I want you to think about this question. How can we make sure our messages don't get listened to or changed or altered along the way, which is, um, which is bad too? So go ahead and pause the video and think about that for a second. Okay, so now I want you to think about that first off. This is not a new problem at all. So this has been around for a long time. This is a picture of Julius Caesar here. And although it wasn't the Internet, they wanted to send messages all around the Roman Empire and not have them be, not if they fall into the wrong hands, they want to make sure those messages can't be read. So there's something called a Caesar cipher. And it looks like, and this is what was used um, by Caesar in the Roman times. And what it would be is basically, if you see, you may you do a mapping from the alphabet to some new letters. So the idea here is that you just shift over. So if I wanted to write a D, I would write an A. If I wanted to write an E, I would write a B. If I wanted to write an F, I would write a C, and all down the line. And you could do this in different ways because I could shift, this shifts um, three over, right? Or maybe four over. Yeah, one, two, three. No, three over, right? So this shifts three over. But I could shift 10 over, 15 over. I could shift one over, right? And they, it does the same thing. So let's, let's try our, um, yeah, this is the shift of minus three here. So let's try our hand at this. So this is a Caesar cipher that has a shift of plus one. What is it? So I want you to just pause the video and try to decipher this this line right here. Okay, so you thought about it. Hopefully you figured it out that it is it's plus one. So to decipher it, we go minus one. So the letter before X is W. Letter before I is H. Letter before B is A. So if you keep going in the line, is what is it? Uh, just a little trick there. Okay, so this this Caesar cipher has a shift of plus one. Oh yeah, sorry, same same question. Yeah, so how did you decipher it? You went to minus one, right? Okay, so that's an example of um, a cipher. So this is another pretty darn complex example, and I'll show you. Um, this is called the uh, um, Enigma box. Um, the Germans used this in World War II. If we think about, if we go back to this alphabet one, really you can only shift the alphabet 26 ways, right? Because then you just loop back to the beginning. So there's sort of 26 combinations that you could try. So if you really were a spy um, that really wanted to read what the Roman army had to say, you literally just had to write down 26 times, and it wouldn't be that hard, right? So the Germans figured that out, and they said, okay, well, we need to build something more sophisticated. So they built this box that's much more sophisticated. It has some dials up here. Um, that can change sort of the way it's um, the way it's per, the, the way it, it cipher or the way it encrypts its information, and it also has these plugs down here and that, that are another way to encrypt the information. So it's super duper complicated, and it's actually just a keyboard here that you set these dials and these the, the same way on the box that sends the message and the box that receives the message. And there's actually 15 billion billion different combinations of encryption methods. So it was incredibly, incredibly hard. And you're going to watch um, two videos um, from the movie The Imitation Game of the way they um, actually cracked this, this code. So, but the Caesar cipher and the Enigma are both private key encryptions. Okay? So... The problem is, is that worked fine for the Germans in World War II, and, the, and it worked okay for the Romans, even though there's only 26 possibilities. But it's not good in general. And this is a, um, a big problem, because private keys, the problem is 
all the German officers would have a code book that would tell them where to put these different things. So where to set these dials up here and where to put these switches in here. And every day that co the code would change, so they would change those locations, so every day the encryption would change. But the problem was is that what if I wanted to, to um, and this is not for an army, but what if I wanted to, to set up an account with a new bank online, right? I wouldn't want to have I wouldn't want to send them information about how to break my code um before and just to the bank before I made the connection um with that bank on the internet. So basically there's no way for me to give a code book to everyone I want to talk to on the internet. Um just like the Germans did in World War II and the Romans did. So you're going to look at another way to, to do this, which is actually what's used in, for the Internet, um, which is generating public and private key activities. Um, so you're going to complete the public-private key discussion board activity that you'll see on um, Canvas there. Um, the only other thing I want to say is you're going to watch those imitation game clips, which are about the Enigma. Um, and you'll see how they break it. And actually, um, the main character, who ben Benedict Cumberbatch, I think I have his name correct. But anyway, the main character there plays a man named Alan Turing, and the actual first computer, or the computing device that was actually invented, was invented to break the Enigma code. And you'll see a clip of them um, breaking that code as well. And that is the end of Unit 4. Thank you for watching.